Hello and welcome to our discussion of market failures. Here's a brief overview of what we're going to deal with today. First, we're going to go over markets when they work optimally as a way to help us think about what can go wrong during a market failure. After that, we'll talk about objective market failures using the examples of monopolies and negative externalities. Next, we'll talk about the debates over subjective market failures. And finally, we'll conclude by talking about perverse incentives, which are some of the problems policymakers face when trying to address market failures. We'll talk a lot about a classic problem dealing with cobras, so you'll definitely want to stay tuned for that. So let's begin. To think about market failure, let's start by thinking about how markets work at a very basic level. This is a picture of a regular supply and demand curve, and it's something that should be familiar to those of you who have had an introduction to economics class. And if you've had such a class, then you're about as familiar with the concepts here as I am, so we're not going to go too far into detail. I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page and we all understand the very basic underlying logic of the free market. So looking here at the supply and demand curve, we see that on the y-axis here, we have the price. And this is the price that a product is bought and sold at. On the x-axis, we have the quantity, and that is the quantity of the products that are bought and sold. Here we see a few different curves. This is the supply curve, the amount of the product that is supplied, and here we see demand. And you can see that this is just a really basic relationship. If demand moves up, as it does um, from D1 to D2, then we'll also see the price go up, and we might also see supply go up. The basic idea here and the underlying intuition is that supply and demand interact with one another and that price is the tie that binds them together. High demand translates into a willingness to pay more and price is the bottom line. It is actually quite an ingenious arrangement as price allows us to give an objective, flexible worth to a commodity. This is an incredibly powerful way to organize the economy because it drives competition and innovation. It is also, in theory, extremely efficient. These markets should always be moving towards equilibrium, meaning that they reach a point at which all factors are balanced. This is also called market clearing. Here we mean that they are always going for that center point, the point at which the amount supplied meets the amount demanded and everybody pays no more and no less than they are willing and able to pay for the product. Of course, that's not the reality in almost any system, uh, but this ideal where there's complete efficiency and there's no wasted products, no leftover demand, that's the underlying logic that the competition of the free market is supposed to promise. Now, market failures occur when an economic market does not produce or distribute the needed or simply desired goods and services. These failures can be objective or subjective. Objective market failures mean that the logic of the supply and demand curve simply does not work and that the market is producing an inefficient outcome. There is no equilibrium and the market does not clear, creating inefficiency, waste, or price hiking. A subjective market failure occurs when the basic supply and demand equation works, but when the outcome is somehow undesirable. These typically occur because something gets left out of demand, which is what we'll discuss later. For now, let's just know that this is a tricky area because it is not that uncommon that one group of people sees something as an undesirable outcome, whereas another group sees it as something completely acceptable. This gets back to our distinction between the necessary, beneficial, and politically generated roles of the state regarding the economy and the debates around those classifications that we've already dealt with. Moreover, people may often just have different values, and this can go a long way in explaining who sees something as a market failure that needs to be fixed and who doesn't see it in that light. Let's start with the objective ways markets can fail. In other words, when something occurs that makes the logic of the supply and the demand curve break down, meaning price ceases to work as a good link between the two. This is what happens with monopolies. Monopolies are a situation in which a single firm controls the production, distribution, and or sale of a particular product, forcing all others out of business and preventing new competitors from entering the market. Obviously, this is a really bad thing from the point of view of the consumer who can end up paying way more for that product. Basically, without competition, the single firm does not have to react to demand. That firm can just set the amount produced at whatever level they choose and charge as much as they think they can get away with, which without competition will be quite a lot. This is also undesirable in terms of product delivery and innovation. As one big firm that already sells as much of its product as it could possibly hope to produce will not really strive to make better products like a group of firms who are all locked in close competition for their market share. 
Therefore, most states have very strict antitrust laws and various other policies aimed at keeping firms from becoming monopolies. However, there are exceptions to this because there are markets in which there isn't really a way around a monopoly. That's called a natural monopoly. These occur when there is something about the product or the market for that product that severely biases the market towards one firm. This is typically because the cost for entering the market for a product makes it very difficult for competitors to enter. This is often because of an enormous amount of upfront investment that is needed before you can even compete in a certain market. So this is often the case with public utilities. So let's think of the power company, for example. To get power to people, the power company needs to build very expensive plants and a really expensive distribution system uh, in the form of these big power lines. Now, this means that it is incredibly expensive to enter the market, and that's why there is typically only one power company. To keep power companies and other utilities from making off with all the people's money, almost all governments regulate public utilities to some extent. So another form of objective market failure that we are going to talk about are externalities. Externalities are something that an individual or an organization does that affects the welfare of others. This is sort of an unintended hidden consequence of some sort of economic activity. And this economic activity has effects that are not really included in the price. And because they're not included in the price, they're not part of that supply and demand logic that we looked at earlier. A classic example of this is when a planter factory dumps its waste into a river, and that can contaminate food supplies, so for example if livestock eats it, or even contaminate humans directly through contaminating drinking water. Now, this doesn't really get included in the price. In fact, it might help cut the price of the factory's product. However, it is an obvious negative externality. It's an obvious disadvantage to the people in that community who are literally being poisoned by that plant's activity. So this is another place where we'll often see governments step in to correct these market failures by enforcing policies that keep these sort of things from happening. So monopolies are bad situations anyway you cut it, unless of course you're a monopolistic firm. The same is true of negative externalities. However, there are a number of situations in which things are much less cut and dry, and these are our subjective market failures. That is, they might be a market failure in the eyes of some, but not according to others. Many of these situations come down to the mismatch between demand and what economists call effective demand. Demand is the amount people are willing to pay, while effective demand is the amount that people are willing and able to pay. So effective demand is only that demand that is backed by the actual ability to pay. You basically have to have the cash in your pocket. For instance, hungry people without any money have a great real demand, a very great real need for food in general, but their effective demand is zero. Remember that the market works through price, and my desire for something doesn't affect the supply and demand curve unless I have some money to back that desire up. Therefore, markets only react to effective demand. Thus. The profit motive propelling the market is indifferent to a lot of things that most people care about, like making sure that everybody has enough to eat. We can think about poverty and inequality through the lens of a lack of effective demand. People who lack economic resources cannot provide effective demand even for things that are necessary to their survival, like food and health care. While providing these essentials for the abject poor is typically not very controversial, the debate about welfare policies can be extremely heated. How much aid is the right amount? Where do you draw the line between helping those in need and giving so much aid that there's little incentive to get out of poverty? Dealing with poverty and inequality is really tricky, and we're not going to go into the minute details here, except to point out that there's, a, there's kind of a catch-22 when it comes to inequality here. Most people will agree that extreme inequality, and now we're talking a few people who have their own private jets where all, most of the country is literally going to bed hungry. Uh, that's pretty uncontroversial. Most people think that that's a pretty bad thing. In addition to seeming morally wrong, this is a situation that can lead to enormous political instability and violence, and can therefore be counterproductive in terms of economic growth. On the other hand, the idea that those who work harder or come up with better ideas will be rewarded is actually integral to the motivation that propels the free market forward and makes it really the most productive system of, of economic organization that we know of today. So, you know, again, we see that there are these really hard trade-offs, and that policy will often come down to a very tricky game of line drawing. 
Another way to think about why market failures might happen due to low effective demand is to think back to our discussion of how states exist to a large degree to provide public goods. Recall that a public good is a resource that is by its nature accessible to all once it exists. There is something inherent in the nature of public goods that means that people can't be excluded from consuming them. In other words, these are what we will call non-excludable resources. Providing these goods tends to benefit the society as a whole. For instance, high quality roads and schools are great for both quality of life and economic development. The struggle here is that public goods tend to be underprovided because of low effective demand. This is because of the collective action problem in free riding that is inherent. We all want to use the public good, but we don't want to contribute. Combine this with the psychological fact that whether it is with a friend, a spouse, a sibling, or society, we all as individuals tend to overestimate our own contributions and underestimate the contributions of others. So this is why free markets will tend to drastically underproduce public goods. That is, people will typically demand pretty high services, but they don't think that they have to pay for them. This means that the state is often involved in stepping in to solve these problems, whether they relate to alleviating poverty, to rebuilding after a natural disaster, or to providing care for the elderly. In all of these situations, people generally want to avoid the effects of a complete market failure, like mass starvation or a lot of old people living in squalor, but we don't typically want to foot the bill. We see this again and again in surveys conducted here in the United States and around the world. In the United States, people overwhelmingly want lower taxes, and they overwhelmingly want lower spending. But as soon as you ask them if that money should come from cuts to defense, or education, or infrastructure, or social security, or what, people will almost never say that they're willing to cut any single program. So there's a real problem facing societies to provide public goods effectively, and in a way that people feel is fair. There is another major caveat to this debate about when to intervene in the market to fix market failures. We have already discussed that two people may not see the same thing as a market failure, and to further complicate the situation, the ways to fix a market failure are also hotly debated. This is largely because these are incredibly complex systems and it is very difficult to know the best way to overcome the problems, particularly when it comes to the problems of changing human behaviors. One common problem facing solutions to market failure is that these solutions themselves might create new problems. They might have unintended consequences that make the original problem even worse. These unintended consequences are often called perverse incentives, or the cobra effect. So let's start with that last one. The cobra effect gets its name from a story coming out of India during the time of British colonialism. The British authorities in India became understandably concerned with the number of cobras in Delhi. They came up with a pretty straightforward new policy to get rid of them. They'd hand out a cash reward for each dead cobra, and eventually all of the cobras would be hunted and turned in, and eventually those British wouldn't have to be so careful about where they played cricket. However, people didn't react the way that the colonials hoped. They did get a ton of dead cobras, but the cobra population did not go down. Instead, many people saw this as an opportunity to make a bit of extra money. So they started cobra farms, and they would basically raise a bunch of cobras, uh, kill them whenever they needed some money, and bring that dead cobra to the British authorities. But eventually, the authorities figured this out and stopped offering the cash reward. However, what do you do if you're a cobra farmer and all of a sudden you have nowhere to sell your cobras? Well, unless you just like the feeling of having a bunch of cobras in your yard, you let them go. And that's just what happened most of the time. So you can see why this, this situation is called perverse incentives. This policy created an incentive for people to farm cobras. In the end, the policy of paying for dead cobras had the exact opposite effect that the authorities had wanted. They wanted to get rid of all the cobras, and instead they, were in, they ended up with a bunch of cobras that were bred because of that policy. So this is a rather dramatic example, but it's not too hard to think about how certain policies aimed at fixing the problems we face with market failures can end up backfiring and making the original problems worse. This is actually a really common criticism of certain welfare policies especially universal entitlement policies. The idea being that if welfare policies are too generous, lots of people will just stay on the policies instead of trying to get out of the bad situations that made them seek out assistance in the first place. A closely related concept is moral hazard. So this is another kind of unintended consequence. And moral hazards happen when a policy causes people to take unnecessary risks or incur extra costs because they will not have to deal with the consequences. So this is often seen as a problem in healthcare, especially with the insurance industry. 
So imagine that I, um, I have something wrong with me and I go to the doctor and I have to pay a $15 copay. And I have to pay that copay regardless of whether I go into the doctor and she says, I think you, you're pretty much fine. Or I have to pay that same $15 copay if she says, well, you're probably fine, but let's just do this really big CT scan to make sure. Well, if it's all the same to my pocketbook and I want to be 100% sure and the doctor wants to basically cover herself in case there is a 0.0001% chance that I have something seriously wrong with me that she wants to catch early, well, we're going to go ahead and order that really expensive procedure because for both of us, it really doesn't make a difference. However, when everybody is doing this, it makes a huge difference. Basically, there's a huge demand for CT scans and other expensive medical scans, treatments, and procedures. And what we know of the free market is that demand causes price to go up. So this is why we see really high healthcare costs in the United States. Another classic example of moral hazards is the failure of the banking industry, in which some banks were labeled as too big to fail by the government. The idea was that if these financial institutions failed, they'd bring the entire economy down with them, so they had to be bailed out. However, when banks know that they will get bailed out in the end, they are much more likely to make risky deals because they know that even if these risks end in failure, they'll get bailed out. Once again, policies meant to correct market failures, like ensuring the economy stays moving by backing up the banks, can actually cause more problems. They can actually lead to behaviors that they're trying to avoid. So as we can see, even if most in a society can agree that they need to address a market failure, the ways to actually do this can be quite complicated and fraught with potential for error. As we've seen with a lot of the work in political economy, these issues are incredibly complex and so much depends on both subjective factors like value positions and numerous minute details about the actual effects of a given policy. So if you take one thing away from our work in the political economy, let it be that you are extremely skeptical whenever you hear a politician, a talking head, or a drunk uncle tell you that they understand everything about the economy and that it all boils down to one magic factor. It's just never that simple. Well, thank you all very much for your time and your attention.